I think it's the same. I think there's always the same amount of people who are politically engaged in music as there ever was. When I say politically engaged, I don't, I don't mean songs that are like uh, manifestos. In fact, the weird thing is, I think politics, politicians are less politically engaged than they would have been 30 years ago. And in a weird way, the politicians have become more like pop stars. They're sold as pop stars, they're sold as product, aren't they? You know, Tony Blair won the election because he looked good on TV and he's very good at talking. He was the lead singer. When Gordon Brown took over, it's like the bass player becoming the front man. It just didn't work. And that's how it works now because everything's, every, everything's media orientated. When I say media, pop orientated. Pop culture is everywhere now. So there's a lot of ways that makes it harder for people in pop music and rock and roll to say things that people can listen to because everybody's pop now, from Alan Sugar to the Prime Minister, they, they all marketed, presented and PR'd like this kind of pop cultural figures. So, but people actually making comments and talk about stuff and singing about stuff, it's still there. You've got great bands like King Blues, etc. It's, it's, you've got a lot of young bands singing about stuff, the Skins, great, great little scene, scar, grubby scar punk bands coming through. I'm sorry, Teenage Riot's still around. I, mean, I can give you loads of endless examples of people yeah, saying stuff. Yeah. Even the mainstream, there's still big bands doing it. I mean, there's a lot of hypocrisy involved. You've got big bands like U2, who kind of um, have a, a liberal political front, but they also put all their money into Holland, you know, so they don't pay any tax in Ireland. So it's all a bit, it's, it's all a bit awkward, isn't it? But there always was in rock and roll, wasn't it? It's, every band's had that problem. You get in the mainstream, you sell loads of records, you make your statements, it's a, it's a liberal left pop culture statement. Some of you are multi-millionaires, then you're stuck, aren't you? Because it's, there's a hypocrisy involved in the... Yeah. It's a problem with science major labels because they're the corporations that, that most free-thinking people aren't comfortable with. On the other hand, what would Clash do at the time? Uh, people say, why don't they put their own records out? But when you're in a band, and I've done it for years doing the DIY thing, and it is a pain in the arse, isn't it? You know, ooh, better ring up the distributor, what the sleeves, get, make the sleeves, glue your own sleeves, which I had to do in the membranes days. You can't imagine the Clash trying to take off in 1977 like making their own record sleeves and trying to get the, trying to get a higher fleet of vans to distribute the records because they're in the top ten. People said why didn't they sign to Rough Trade? But Rough Trade wasn't really it was only a very fledging label at the time. They probably wanted to sign them anyway, they probably wouldn't like them at the time. So I mean it, it's a difficult one, isn't it? I mean I can't blame any musician for making money because I think the other side of the card, when you yes you can be political and free thinking, but you've got you've got to live as well, you know. It's, we just toured America at Crass and there's you know Steve England's Crass and there's people, there's a demonstration outside the gig in San Francisco. Saying the gig was too expensive at $20 and it was the wrong venue. But really I thought, what did they expect him to do? The guy's got no money at all. And in fact on the whole tour he ended up losing money. And he's, he's like in his 50s now. And he's, he's not going to sleep on the floor of a squat now. And it's, it's, it's kind of very, very difficult to keep it really, really pure. I think a really good models is people like Ian Mackay. But Ian Mackay is just a very good businessman as well. Not in a bad way, but in a good way, you know. Because doing business is not a bad thing if you're doing it in a fair kind of way. You're making, ethical. Yeah, you're making great records and selling it for a good price. You do gigs where you don't rip people off and you make sure everyone's comfortable. They're, they're all political gestures, political statements in a way. You're looking after your community, which is really, really important. But at the same time, he's, he's good at business, so he can look after the money. He doesn't waste it, he invests in it. He made his own label, created it, he bought a house to rehearse in. Very smart, like a lot of American bands are. I can't imagine some like the Clash at a point in time where they're, where they're a bit young and crazy and going, first thing we'll do is buy a house, we can rehearse it, then we'll create a record label and I'll count it. It, just, it wasn't like that then, it was all a big rush, wasn't it? Like, get great ideas out and uh, maybe, I, I think they didn't feel good about signing CBS, but they realised maybe that's the only way they can do this, you know. Well, Man Street Preachers, right from the start, said we, we will sell out spectacularly. That was, that, that, that was their manifesto. What, yeah, one level they are liberal left, but another level they said, we're rock and roll sluts, we'll do anything. And we have to be the major label because we want to get to the top. So they've just been really, really honest, actually, in a way, you know. So, it, so, so that made it easier for them. I think nowadays people care less. I think if you put your music on an ad, people don't really care anymore so much. Because I think a lot of people realise that if you're going to download everyone's records and not pay for anything, 
and no one's got any money to pay to get into gigs, how, how the hell do you expect anyone to make any music? You know, so it's, it's got more complicated, it's got more difficult to make anything, a political statement out. We're all, we are all prostitutes on the pop group, Sam, you know, we're, we're all trapped in this. I guess the only way you could do it is to try to do it in a more caring kind of way, you know, don't take the money and run, don't take the money and buy a big mansion out in the countryside, maybe try and put it back in again or something. But you have to realise, the musicians, it's, it's like, it's, it could be a one year thing, you, you could make in a year, you could pretty fucked everything else up your life, you're not going to get a job, like, like a lot of normal people of course. Yeah. But, but how are you going to live the rest of your life? You, it's, you're stuck, aren't you? You can't go down the dole office, everyone's going to go, you know, you, in the old days, you go, you're on top of the pot's three weeks ago, what are you doing here? So you're kind of trapped in this weird limbo land where people, you aren't earning as much money as people think. That's why I don't blame people taking the money and running, you know? Yeah. Completely, yeah. I think you have to you have to be realistic and realise you're all brought out. I mean, that's always interesting when the people were doing this demo in San Francisco because because they, they were still wearing train shoes and those train shoes weren't free. You know, they, you know they were they're from big companies and things. And, and, and companies got far worse business practices than Steve England could ever have in his whole life. I mean, he was just a guy who used to be in an amazing band who, was, who just want to play those songs again. Maybe make about five or ten grand out of the whole thing because he hasn't got a job. It's just just it tied him over for a little bit. Which is a pretty pretty honest way to, to, to it's, it's an honest way to make money if you're a musician is to go play play music to people who are paid to get in. You get some money. It's not it's not like you're trying to make a million quid and hide it in Holland like you too. I mean, he's, he's prepared to put the money back in, back into his, his little community, and it's a celebration of that sound from years ago. Yes, it probably clashed with some of the idea that Crass had at the time, but that was Crass at 20, when he was 20 years old, now he's in his 50s. It's a, it's a different kind of thing, isn't it? It, does, it doesn't mean you become a, a complete Tory and wants to rip you off. There's somewhere, it's somewhere in the middle which is a bit more fuzzier, isn't there? Yeah, and the conditions and th things have changed around it as well. I, th I, th I think things have changed and people got more realistic and I, th I think also the corporates have actually got more control of us, haven't they? But, so it's, but you know, things change all the time and it would be great if you didn't have to do stuff in a corporate kind of way. I try and avoid it as much as I can. Yeah. But there are certain things I get which would be a corporate thing. I use Apple computers, you know, because they are great computers. You can do all your music on them, you can lay out all your artwork, communicate with people. I, don't, my, I haven't got any friends who could build me a computer as good as that, you know, out of matchboxes. It just doesn't exist, does it? So you are buying into it at one level. Well, I'll never buy uh, food in the supermarket, I'd buy, I'd buy the local shop and do this and this and this. That's, that's my thing, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying my thing's a pl great political gesture, but it's just, just things that feel right personally to me. It's not like, I don't, you know, because otherwise someone will see you going to another shop and they, that's why you sound to be like crass, when it? In fact, last year at Blackpool we went to a cafe and we sat there and people said, what are you doing in here? But they said, no, Penny said, no, Steve said, can I go to McDonald's to get a cup of tea? I'm busting for a tea or a coffee. I couldn't find anyone, any, anything anywhere. We only saw the McDonald's. And then they said, I can't really go in there because we're going there. And I, I said, to be honest, I won't let you go in there myself because <laughs> I don't despise McDonald's anyway. So we just found like a local, I said, let's go find a local cafe. It's only because they were desperate for coffee. I mean, it wasn't like they go to McDonald's all the time and they wanted to go there because the only place you could find is open about nine o'clock on a Sunday morning, you know, in the yeah. town centre. Yeah. And it's, it's a choice thing, there isn't a lot of choice, is it? You're stuck sometimes, aren't you? Yeah. I'm one of them sad cases who actually wouldn't go to McDonald's even if I was like dying of thirst, you know. I think, yeah, punk's like, like any form of music, like jazz, or the blues, it's been around a long time, it's become a genre, it's become a form, and a festival like this celebrates that form, which is great, isn't it? We're not going forwards here, we're just celebrating something we love, and I've got no problems with celebrating something that changed my life, and that I really loved when I was 16. It doesn't mean I don't listen to any other types of music, I listen to all types of music all the time, but I still love punk rock. So, yes, on one level this is really retro, but also it's like you, really, lots of young bands taking inspiration from the older bands, which is great as well. They don't sound like them, they have their own version of it. So it's not a completely dead culture, it's not a TED culture, it's kind of going forward at the same time. So it's, it's like young bands who've got a different version of the old band's kind of sound, isn't it? And the energy, it's a folk music as well, it doesn't have to be modern, it doesn't even have to be new, because it's conveying the feeling, and the feeling is an aggressive, a, a, a mostly a fairly positive feeling. And, and it's still got a political edge to it. There's still people sing about 
uh, political issues involved in punk. Not every band. Yeah. And it doesn't matter because some people test your babies are really funny. They're, they're great, great entertainment. In a weird way though, they are kind of slightly political as well, aren't they? They're weird little muddled way, aren't they? <laughs> Fantastic way. So it, it doesn't have to be directly political to be political, does it? And that's what happened in punk. And I think most people get what punk's about in this country. And it goes to other countries, it can get a little bit more dicey, like you go to Russia, and there's a right-wing thing involved in it there, which it is confusing to me because that doesn't seem like anything to do. With the original idea of punk, which came out of a pop cultural context, and it came out, a lot, a lot of the ideology came out of the hippie culture as well. It was, it was like the hippie culture put back on the right track, wasn't it? It was, it was the counterculture, wasn't it? But faster, with a better soundtrack, yeah, yeah. initially. Yeah. The, 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 the idealism of youth, you know, where people say, oh, if you still believe in what you're bleeding when you're young, you waste your life when you're older. I think, I, I think that's rubbish, that, you know. I still, I'm, I'm, I'm not as, utter, I don't, when I was young, I thought everything was sorted out as older. I was that idealistic. Now I realise that we're going, we are living in, in, in a time of eternal war, and there always will be war. And I know that, but you, it doesn't mean you, you stop believing, you, you don't stop believing it's the wrong way to sort problems out, you know. And you'll do your bits, your tiny little micro bit to try and stop that, when you? So, and that, that, that comes a part of our culture, our culture is strongly into that, isn't it? I think rock and roll is a voice of freedom. I mean, I've got a very good example of this. Was uh, when I met a friend of mine who was in St. Petersburg, one of the main hippie guys in St. Petersburg. And he said, in growing up in the 60s, the Beatles, they sounded like freedom. That's, they, they, you couldn't but hear the records on the radio. They used to go all the way from St. Petersburg down to Lithuania, because there's a harbour there. And the, the sailors would come off the boats. It's a bit of a reverse the story of getting the blues records in Liverpool coming off the boats in the 50s. They, they got, which introduced the Beatles, you know, the Soul, the Blues and the R&B records. And it's weird enough that happens to the Beatles in Russia. So people go down and get the seven singles, they buy one, go, go, because only one will come off the boat. It's not like old sailors go, hey, take a single. There'd be one record, go, please give us a record. And they'd buy it, take about St. Petersburg, and there'd be about 50 people in the flight and say, listen to the record. And they'd just go, wow, it's so electric and it's, just, it's so pure. Because we listen to the Beatles, it's, it's a sound pure joy in it mm. unbridled joy being young the whole world's yours and that's what they were getting off it and then they saw pictures of them and they saw the, the head long hair it made them realize that you it, to them it's a sign of freedom and it does sound really to us it sounds really poxy and small but to them it's like the biggest thing in the world I mean he said another example is this, there's a rumor went around about 1971 that Santana were playing a gig in St. Petersburg and 300,000 people turned up. Of course, they were not playing in St. Petersburg at all. It was just Chinese whispers. And the KGB went down and arrested those people. He got arrested by the KGB. They took her back to the KGB office and said, right, you've got long hair. So and you, you, you're one of the organizers. No, I'm not. But he said, this, this is how it works, right? You grass everyone up for us and uh, we'll let you off. If you don't, you go to jail. So he went to jail. And that's how it was in Russia at that time, you know. So when we talk about the freedoms in this country, when we talk about yeah, yes, the rich have all the money here and we are controlled, but compared to Russia in the 70s, we can do what the fuck we like. We are pretty free here, but in a way, in a sense, you know, compared to what they had, you know, and, um, and when I speak to him about what it's like then, it's, it's pretty heavy, you know, I mean, he's got stories about um, uh, Putin. Um, a friend of his, a woman, was uh, beaten up by Putin in KGB office because KG, he was a KGB officer, you know, so you get mad stories to go to those places, you know, how close it is to you, you know. Now, public culture is always reinventing stuff. There's always new music coming along. You look at dubstep, grime, those types. It's funny when people say that, oh, there's no music. The kids have, they just, they don't have any new music anymore. And it doesn't shock them anymore. They go, well, listen to this. And I put a dubstep record and they go, ooh, it's horrible. It's unlistenable. They go, well, there you go. It's, it still works, doesn't it? You know, like people our age don't like young people's music. It's still, that situation still occurs. Because people like to think that when they were a teenager, it was the greatest time ever. And it, for me, it was the greatest time. It was a great time being a teenager. But the music people are making now is still as valid, it's still as exciting as it was then. But, but I'm lucky, see, because being a music journalist, I get to send stuff, and I've always been sent stuff, so I've not, not had the five, ten year gap 
where I heard nothing because you, you can't catch back up again. So for me, it's just continuing process, you know. That. It is now. Music politics is treated very seriously academically. I, I just um, two weeks ago I did a two-week course, took a two-week course in Leeds on music, pop culture, politics, northwest, northern England, and uh, we get, I do few lectures going around. People just get you in, wheel you into doing stuff like that. So yeah, it's get. I would argue that music's getting taken uh, too academically serious by some people. So you get very dry academic. Um, explanations, you know, you get a lot of punk books are very dry and academic, and you're thinking that, that isn't really why it happened, you know. So, you know, Graham Marx's book, Let's See Traces, go for it. Yeah, but, but is it, is, that's not how it happened. It's not, it's not the reasons that people in the bands, you know. Most people in bands, yes, they feel idealistic because they're youthful, but most people in bands because they just want to get on the stage and show off. It's, it's very basic, very primal, isn't it? It's not, you, you, can, have the, you can have the cool reasons on afterwards, but mo it's, it's, it's pretty dumb, most of it. But, but the, the dumbness creates something that's really beautiful and bigger. But it's not like everyone's going on stage with a manifesto in their heads. Most people go on stage just, just to fuck with things, aren't they, and have a good time. I mean, yeah. that's what the Pistols were, that's what the Clash were, Bob Dylan. I mean, these, they, they weren't on stage going, I, I want to change the world. So that, that became part of the culture, the cultural thing, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, the, the most the people who changed the world were cultural pushers, weren't necessarily the bands, were they? Music is a language beyond language. You can, you can hear, it doesn't, doesn't matter, we played in Algeria and the kids got it, you know, because it just because they get what we do is pure energy and it's up, and they just got that. They didn't have to know what we're singing about, it doesn't matter. They've they never seen a punk band, no punk band's ever played there. They just thought, energy, great, jump up and down, great, brilliant, that was it. It's, it's so simple. I, I don't have to explain it in, in Algerian or French, you, you just played it and people understood it. And that's, that's the magic of music, it's, 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 a, it's, it's the best art form in the world, and the most basic, anybody can make it and anybody could communicate the most basic emotions through it, which I think is what makes it so powerful, isn't it? But that's what annoys me when it gets uh, manipulated like X Factor or something, which is not about music at all, weirdly, it's about the celebrity of the judges, it's not about the people singing. It's not about singing anyway, it's all auto-tuned, isn't it? It's not, it's, music's far more basic than that. Music, the best music in the world, you go see a bunch of 15-year-old kids, you can't play on a stage, first gig, look a bit nervous, it's a complete racket. That's so pure and so amazing that the whole of X Factor just, it, it can't compete with that because it's so controlled, so manipulated and they sell a million records that, that a year's time no one listens to, you know. Whereas that bunch of 14 year old kids, though, four, five of their mates listen to their records a year's time. They're the winners in there, they don't get, they don't get, well the bands don't get any money in X Factor anyway, but they'll have more power because they've done something pure, you know. Yeah. Music's part of the soundtrack of politics now. To the extent of George Bush using Born in the USA as a rabble rousing song in America, not realising all the verses were anti Vietnam War and anti, anti him, basically. But he didn't get that, which is, I think is quite fantastic. And there's examples recently with, with the Tory party doing the same thing, isn't there? Like, you know, using their British band songs, people not been happy about that as well, isn't it? Yeah. Look, London's calling getting used to the Olympics, that's one example recently. Which is nothing wrong with that in a way, but the Olympics is a very corporate version of sport. It's more corporate than the Premiership, I hate the Olympics. It's great, the great sports, but it's so controlled by American drug companies. And, and, and they're used in London's Calling, which is a very dark, ap apocalyptic song. But they only get the chorus, they only listen to the chorus. I think that's so great though, isn't it? Yes. Yeah.
that's a good point, John. Yeah. It's, 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 it's always great when you get one over, and it's like the Goon Show in Spike Milligan in the fifties. They sneak things in all the time. That, that's what they say. We sneak it in over the BBC. Yeah. The BBC wouldn't notice they're putting things in there. Loads of slang words for like rude things. It's like staying ahead, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's quite funny, the game, isn't it? Absolutely. But a lot of politicians generally really like music. I've got, uh, so I've got some Labour MP friends of mine, and one of them was a woman, she's a massive UK UK fan. And she likes a lot of punk music, she likes the membranes and stuff like that. There's a few, I've met a few because I've been doing this visa thing, get a of visas. The British bands get to America and trying to get the law changed. It will never do it because it's American law. I've met quite a lot of MPs, and there's a, there's a guy there, from uh, MP from Blackburn and Accrington, who does a Clash website. Right. And he got into politics but via the Clash. So it's working, it's there, isn't it? Yeah. But they say you're up against, it's Class Wars, what they call it. The, the, the Tories are like 21 millionaires on the front row. And they're, they're basically, they're crushing us, you know. And then, the weird thing is, we went to meet um, Ed Varsley, the culture secretary. Yeah. said, Ed, Ed, what's your favourite band? And he goes, oh, it's an 80s band, you won't know them. I think he's going to say, it's the band of the it's the Redskins. So that's kind of proof that people don't listen. He said, I don't, I, I skip the lyrics. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's interesting, isn't it? So it's a lot more blurred, a lot of people on the right, they have some right-wing views and some left-wing views and they have some pop culture views all mixed together, don't they? Yes. So you look at uh, Sarah Palin, who's probably the most right-wing politician in the mainstream you can think of, probably has some cool records, you know, but, but and she probably has some pop culture views that we probably wouldn't disagree with and a lot of other stuff we probably totally disagree with, you know, Boris Johnson the same, Boris Johnson's favourite band is The Clash, isn't it? Yes. And there's a Tory MP, it's Mick Jones's cousin, isn't there? Is that right? Yeah, so it's, it's kind of a... We're, we're, we're a lot closer, a lot more tied into that mainstream politics than we think. We think we're on the outside. And that's the perception most people think. They think it's all over there. Yes. Well, a lot of those people are quite normal people, like the same kind of music, and probably went through the same kind of thought processes. They ended up in a different place, didn't they? Yes. So I think it's too easy to say, the right wing are all that, the left wing are all that. It's a big blurring in the middle, isn't it? Complex. Hey? It's a lot more complex, isn't it? It's a lot more complex, yeah, isn't it? Right, John, yeah. The worst thing is, though, when people like Sarah Palin get the power, they tend to like go towards the very right wing views. Yes. And they, they the kind of. The market agenda, the neo, the neo con agenda. Yeah. Really, really bad stuff for Tea Party. But, but there's like probably a few things that people like that probably themselves personally don't think. I'm giving her the benefit of the doubt here. Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, hopefully she's a bit more human, you know. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah.